Good morning, First Family. We're glad that you're here today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Could you ask for a prettier day uh, to come and worship the Lord? We have gl we're glad that you've made that decision, both those of you with us in person, those of you watching at home. We're glad for everyone that is sharing this time of worship as we turn our thoughts and attention to the Lord, give Him the praise that He alone is due. Uh, we want to be praying for Brian and Betsy as they're away in Florida this week. Uh, Brian's getting to spend his mother's 92nd birthday with her and family. That's the first time he's been able to be with his mother on her birthday in a long time. So be praying for them while they're away. We do have a little announcement to make today from our pastor search committee. You should have received a mailing this week, information in the church newsletter. Uh, there are other opportunities to learn about what will be going on uh, two weeks from uh, this weekend as we have the opportunity to get to know uh, Dr. Darren Lambert and his family in a much better, much uh, more close and up personal kind of way. There will be events on Saturday for you to come by and meet the family and get to know them better. Uh, Darren will be uh, sharing his trial sermon with us that Sunday in both the 8.30 and 11 a.m. worship services. After each service, you'll have the opportunity to vote on the recommendation, the unanimous recommendation from our pastor search committee uh, to call him to be our next pastor. And it's a little bit unusual because of the virus situation. There'll be many people watching that trial message at home. Uh, we want them to have that opportunity to participate in the process as well. So if you're here to vote in either one of the services, that's great. But for those of you that will be watching at home, you will have the opportunity to call the church office or to respond electronically, registering your vote. And that will be open until 3 p.m. on Monday afternoon. Again, that will be open until 3 p.m. Monday afternoon. At that time, the vote will become official. We'll have an announcement to make. We look forward to that weekend. You be uh, praying, you be prepared as we participate and look forward to what God will do in our church as a whole. Let's go to him in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for this glorious day that you have made. Truly, your people, uh, Lord, we can say, we can proclaim with others that we are glad uh, when we are able to enter the house of the Lord. Father, you are worthy of our praise. You alone are our creator. You are our sustainer. You're our redeemer. You're our friend. We thank you, Lord, for the awesome opportunity to have that personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, while the weather outside is sunny and beautiful, we know this morning there is much that uh, troubles our land. We pray for your healing power. We pray for your unity. Lord, we know that the ultimate answers to our problems as a nation, as a world, and even as individuals, Father, the answer to what troubles mankind, uh, Lord, that can be found in a relationship with your son, Jesus. So, Lord, we, thank, we pray that you would be drawing men and women, boys and girls, to yourself. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we will hear, have in this service to hear how you are doing exactly that, how your word is being fulfilled. Uh, Lord, how you are calling people to turn from their sin, to repent and believe in Jesus, and how you are transforming lives today. Lord, bless every aspect of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. As, as a reminder, if you would like uh, to see a worship guide, it was emailed to you this morning and you can pull it up on your phone. Let's begin reading responsively from the book of Revelation. You'll see the words on the screen. So if you'll stand and join with us as we uh, read this. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. By your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. 
all nations will come and worship before you for you for your righteous acts have been revealed hallelujah for our lord god almighty reigns let us The hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, was written by Edward Pyramet in 1779. Soon after, Reverend E.P. Scott was a missionary to India. One day, he passed a man of unusual appearance, a man from a mountain tribe, unreached by the gospel. Mr. Scott prayed over the matter and against the pleadings of his friends, decided to visit the tribe. As he neared their village, he was ambushed by a war party. They seized him. Spears pointed at his heart with no hope of escape. Scott calmly opened his violin case, breathed a prayer, and began to sing, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. At every kindred, every tribe, he opened his eyes. The warriors stood in tears, spears lowered. Mr. Scott was allowed into the village. He spent two years among them. Many believed in Christ. I get it. Let's get a guy who doesn't talk very loud normally and doesn't talk very clear normally and put a mask on him and then have him talk to kids who are watching by way of television. I think that sounds like a good idea, don't you? And let's give him a prop because he always needs a prop. How many of you all have something that looks like this in your car or in your home? If you'll raise your hand. Those of you who are watching by television, hundreds of hands just went up here in the sanctuary. Shh, don't tell. <laughs> My dad told me one thing, and then I went to scouts, and it, he told, they told me there the same thing. The line was, be prepared. Not only for what might happen to you, but what might happen to other people. You never know when you might need a box like this, a toolbox, to help yourself out or to help somebody else out. And I began to get my old toolbox. That's why it's in such a pretty sanctuary right now. This is one I've had for years, and I do carry it along with me a lot of different places. Now, my toolbox has two different levels to it. It has one level that looks like this and one level that looks a little bit more like this. Now, in the bottom level, I have my heavy tools. The heavy tools are the ones that I can't mess up. I can't do anything wrong with. I know this is a hammer, and it has one purpose. And this is a wrench, and it has another purpose. I never try to use this for the purpose of this. And then I have a saw here, too. Uh, I can get hurt with this, and I sometimes have, but usually there's just one way to use this. 
Now, it reminded me that God gives us two different kinds of gifts, not only to help ourselves, but more than that, to help other people. He gives us natural gifts, gifts that we can hone, gifts that we can go to school to increase, gifts gifts that we know a little bit more about. He gives us gifts of values. Through our experience and our family, we learn certain things are important to us. That's one of the natural gifts that God gives us. He also gives us interest. Uh, Those of you who watch the Wares in the World and Reverend Reverend Rod know that we have a lot of people with a lot of different interests in here. God uses our interests to minister to people. He also uses our personality. That's something he gives us. Some of us are more quiet. Some of us are more loud. Some of us speak before we talk. And some of us think and think and think before we say anything. He gives us personality, he gives us interest, and he gives us values. But he also, in addition to the natural gifts that he gives us to help ourselves and mostly other people, he gives us what we call supernatural gifts. Now, supernatural gifts are a little bit different. They're, well, in my life, they're a little more fine gifts. Smaller gifts like this that we can use in situations that call for a little special attention. I've got my fine tools in the top of my uh, tool kit, and so I can find them right off. They are different kinds of gifts. It's interesting that we can hone these gifts, we can nurture these gifts, we can learn with these natural gifts, but the supernatural gifts, we have... Well, we don't deserve them. We don't earn them. God just gives them these gifts. We have the gifts of manifestation. That's when we're in a situation and we want to show God's powers. We want to manifest God's powers. So we have the gifts of manifestation. And everybody has those gifts. We also have the gifts of motivation. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to be motivated to do what God asked me to do. That's what we're here for as a body. We motivate one another. And there are different kinds of motivational gifts. There are also gifts of ministry. And this is the one that most of you know. The gifts of ministry is how we serve one another. He created us in a body. He created us to serve one another and people outside the church. So the gifts of ministry, of motivation, and the gifts of manifestation. God talks about these gifts through the Paul in Romans chapter 12, verses 8. Well, let's go back to 6. And since we all have gifts differing, different gifts because of our experience and our personality and how he combines all these gifts in each one of us, since we have all these gifts, let us exercise these gifts with great mercy and according to our faith. There's other verses that remind us of the different gifts. Actually, in the Bible, there are 37 spiritual gifts in addition to the gifts that we have over here. So, as you go out and minister to one another, as you minister outside this body and inside this body, as you minister to and as you minister to others, remember that God has created you uniquely. He's created one of a kind. You are one of a kind. You're unique in the family of God. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you that you created us with a purpose in mind. You created us being available to you and equipping us to do just exactly what you want us to do. We are grateful for how you made us. We're grateful for the power that you give us the presence that you embellish us with, and the power that you put within us. For it's in Christ's name we gather here this morning, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm thrilled to introduce to you today our guest speakers, Jeff and Angie Sundell. Jeff and Angie have two daughters and one son. Uh, The reason they got trapped in the United States during COVID-19 is that uh, they were home for the birth of their first grandson who was born in March. Uh, Jeff and Angie were uh, a part of our Southern Baptist International Mission Board as missionaries to Nepal and India for 10 years. Uh, 
about 10 years ago, they came back to the United States. I think about the time their children were uh, going to be finishing up high school to give them a, a little bit of an American school experience, but also uh, they became a part of E3 Partners. Jeff is global strategy for church planting. That's where he serves. Together they spend about half the year in India, the other half of the year in Greece, ministering, serving, uh, working for the Lord. Uh, part of the uh, vision of E3 Partners, and I know Jeff and Angie's personal vision, is that there would be no place left, no place left where people have not had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Welcome them as they come to share with us today. Um, I, uh, I, 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 interesting, I have a little bit of background with uh, Salisbury in the sense of um, when I was 16 years old, I used to deliver parts down here for my dad um, for his business, but then I would spend, there's a little hotel down the road right here off I-85, the old I-85, I think, and I used to spend um, time there and I'd go hunting through the woods here looking for 66 Chevelles and 76 69 Chevelles and 70 Chevelles. Anyhow, so I bought a lot of old cars here way back in the day. And then um, I actually ended up in the classic car business for a number of years, buying and selling muscle cars. My family still does that to this day. Um, so anyhow, and then I found barbecue here. That was the other uh, barbecue and uh, sausage and biscuit gravy. So um, anyhow, so uh, long history with Salisbury. And then my daughter used to play golf here against one of the local universities. So we've spent about three years coming here, walking around the golf course, watching our daughter at NGU play golf here. So excited to be here with you. Um, in 1986, I actually ended up moving to Charlotte, North Carolina. And... Um, I, uh, I met a guy from New Jersey at uh, Charlotte Transit System, and Ron Barbagli um, shared the gospel with me. And um, I didn't really know what to do with it. I didn't know how to respond. And so I, I sort of sat on it for about 10 days and started going to a little church in Denver, North Carolina. And, um, and about 10 days later, I got beside my bed and I repented and believed in Jesus Christ. And Christ radically changed my life um, from the direction I was headed. And um, loved my muscle cars, loved my racing. But over time, I, there, there was began this wrestling match in my heart of doing business and this sense of God's calling. And, um, but I kept thinking, where do I fit in the kingdom? Because um, honestly, I don't, I, don't, I don't like hospitals. So if you're sick, like I'm not the pastor you want. Because I'm, I'm almost as sick as you are when I get there. Because I just get sick when I get to a hospital. And so, and then if you die, I'm like really bummed you died. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I like to share from the word and I like to maybe marry somebody here and there, but I'm like, where do I fit in the kingdom? And in uh, 1996, as we were running our business and volunteering and doing youth ministry, um, I was down at Caswell and there, there was a quarterback from Carson Newman shared about uh, Paul in chapter nine of... Um, Romans, I'm sorry, of um, chapter nine of Acts. And he was talking about Paul's conversion. And, and I remember that night, for whatever reason, it just gripped my heart. And I said, man, I have got to go. And so, but my wife and I have been having, we'll just say a small debate for several years to the point the debate was, don't talk to me about calling. So um, just stick to business. Uh, you're good at it, let's do that. So there was no conversation. So I was praying and I said, okay, God, I'll do this, but you better talk to her because uh, we ain't on the same page on this thing. And so um, we prayed and asked God to speak to her and um, went home and I said, baby, I got something to tell you. And she's like, no, wait, I got something to tell you. And then we sort of argued about who tell who what. And then uh, I finally let her go first. And she said, hey, God spoke to me and he told me that I was to be like Sarah. And wherever Abraham went, we were to go. I said, well, praise God, man. God told me we were supposed to go to the mission field. And she's like, no, 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 that's a little too far. Let's just go to Southeastern Seminary or something. But anyhow, we, next couple of years, it worked out. And um, we felt called to South Asia. And so we went and served um, in India. And, and honestly, what drew us was uh, this thought right here, that every one and a half seconds, 
somebody dies and goes into eternity and never hears the name of Jesus. And that happens day in and day out in South Asia. About 1.6 billion people in all of South Asia, 1.2 billion in India. Um, these unraged people groups we were talking about earl earlier with all hail the name of Jesus, that's the greatest concentration of them left on the face of the earth that need reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so to realize every 10 days about 200,000 people die and go into eternity and never meet the name of Jesus, and about daily 28, 38,000 people the size of Shelby, North Carolina dies and goes to eternity, never meets the name of Jesus, never meets somebody who speaks to them and tells them about Jesus or loves them in the name of Jesus. And so that really just broke our hearts um, that we felt like, man, we, we've got to go. We'd never been there before. We just flew in with our three little kids and um, straight there. But we had a, a tremendous experience in South Asia. Um, but this is where I, I just want to share is we just have a conviction that everybody deserves the right to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from somebody's mouth to their ear. That at least once in, li once in their lifetime, um, they will have that opportunity. You know, and um, in 1986, I got my opportunity down in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Charlotte Transit System. But most people around the globe don't get that opportunity. And so we wanna, we're going to take a look. Um, Angie and I are going to tag team this a little bit, so this might be a little different than usual. But we travel um, in South Asia and Greece, and we, uh, we travel. And people go, how do you work with your wife? We're like, we have a blast doing it, but other people are like, that's, that's crazy. But we actually have fun training and gospeling and coaching missionaries around the globe, living in Greece and India. And so we do a lot of this together. And... Um, we're going to talk, we're going to sort of look at the church in Corinth is what we're going to do. So I'm going to be sort of jumping around in Acts chapter 18 if you're wondering where I'm at. But I'm also, I work a lot with illiterates. I know y'all aren't illiterate, but I'm going to share the story of Corinth just to give you a flavor for it. But if we step back to Paul, and Paul um, meets uh, Christ on the Damascus Road and he's converted. And, you know, you got the guy who was the persecutor who was standing there when Stephen um, was stoned to death. He was jailing people. He was imprisoning people. He was beating people. He was pushing more people to do that. That was, that was Paul's role, basically, in the early church before he met Jesus. Well, now this guy meets Jesus, and now he is willing to go to the ends of the earth. He's willing to make sure the gospel is preached and proclaimed everywhere. Um, just as uh, Pastor John said, till there's no place left, John 15, uh, 21 through 23, that the gospel will be preached to every people, every place. And so um, as we think about this early time when Paul leaves and he's, he's in um, Antioch and he goes from Antioch and he goes down in the first journey and um, goes to Cyprus and Lystra and Derby and Iconium and he's there and he's just, just imagine the setting. It's very much like what we think in the Middle East or what we think in North Africa or India. There's no Christians um, in these areas. Um, they've not yet heard of the name of Jesus. Now, there are Jews in these areas. And Paul goes first to the Jews and proclaims the gospel of Christ's death, burial, resurrection. And then he goes to the Gentiles. And this is his normal pattern. And he goes back to Antioch, reports what God's done on that first journey. But Paul is pushed by the Holy Spirit, but by persecution also through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's pushed from these place after place after place, spending about two and a half months in each place, the persecution's that bad. So he goes on the next journey, goes back, visits the churches, strengthens them, picks up Timothy, goes on into Asia, Asia Minor, up to Macedonia. Again, the same thing happens to this man. The persecution is severe. The suffering is severe, shipwrecked, beaten, left for dead. And um, so all these things he was, he's now experiencing. And so he goes down and he's leaving Macedonia. He's only there three Sabbath days. Um, and uh, so three weeks. And he goes down to, Antioch, um, to Athens. And there he proclaims the gospel at Mars Hill. And by himself, he goes up to Corinth. Now Corinth is now, just to give you an idea of what Corinth is like when we think about this church. Um, this is uh, the Isthmus Games are getting ready to happen. So this is why Paul's going because they need tent makers to make tents and the Isthmus games are very similar to Olympic games. Athens is going down in population. Corinth is going up. Corinth is a big economic center at the time. Um, it's full of idols. Um, it's full of 
prostitution. It's full of lots of people trying to make money because you have this little isthmus where the boats would go from the Aegean to the Adriatic Sea. And so a lot of traders and business people were coming through there. So this, this place is booming for that point in time in history. So it's a great place to be sharing the gospel because it's a target rich environment with lots of people far from God that need to hear about Jesus. So Paul is going up there and he meets Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla have come from Rome where there's been a great persecution there. They planted a church in Rome. They are now tent makers also, so they join together. Now, Paul, um, in chapter 18, hears from God in a very unique way. And God speaks very clearly to Paul. He said, I have people in this place. I want you to stay in this place. Well, this is a change because, again, remember, he's been moving because of persecution. Now he's told to stay. And I, this, I'm gonna use, I have my, my sanctified imagination right here is Paul takes the Nazarite vow because we'll see at the end of chapter 18 that Paul goes down and shaves his beard, cuts his hair. But I think he took a Nazarite vow because he's like, okay, God, I've been beaten, persecuted, shipwrecked, and now you want me to stay somewhere? I'm going to die. And so he takes this vow, this Nazarite vow, changes his diet, grows his beard out, grows his hair out, and says, okay, you say you have people here, I'm staying, I'm going to proclaim the gospel. And so Aquila and Priscilla and Paul begin to share the gospel. They go to the synagogue, which they normally do. Um, of course, that causes a big persecution. They get pushed out of the synagogue. They end up in the home of Titicus Justice. And there they are planting a church and they're discipling. And again, the persecution continues to come. The synagogue ruler comes to Christ. Just imagine the synagogue ruler comes to Christ, meets Jesus, leaves the synagogue, comes over to a little church, meeting in a home there. And so now the, the synagogue's up in an uproar. And so Sosthenes, the number two guy at the synagogue, comes over and begins to agitate. And they go before the proconsul. And the proconsul's the ruler. And so they're bringing Paul. And Paul's going, okay, here we go again. We're going to get, get beaten. We're going to suffer. He's standing before the bema seat. And um, where the judgment would normally take place, where they'd hear somebody out, what's happening. And so as he's standing there, um, strangely, the proconsul rules basically in Paul's favor and says, ah, this is a Jewish thing. You guys do what you want to do. I don't want anything to do with it. And the Romans beat Sosthenes up. So this was a little bit of a strange thing that happens in Corinth and shocks Paul in this setting. And so the other thing we, I want to share is this place... Um, it's sort of on the mountains and so you're looking at the sea on one side and you get to the top of the mountain you see the sea on the other side but up on top of the mountain and Angie's going to share a little more um, there's about a thousand temple prostitutes that are coming to and fro that city and they're providing basically a religious service of prostitution and so this is rampant um, in this area um, and there's literally every 50 meters there is some type of a temple or an idol and just all around this place. And of course, we're, we think about 1st and 2nd Corinthians and all the mess that we see in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But we're going to look at a little known guy. Um, if you think about Romans chapter 16, verse 23, it talks about a man named Erasmus. And it says Erasmus is the uh, city treasurer. There's only two appointed positions in the whole Roman government. One is the proconsul, the second is the city treasurer. And so for a long time, uh, liberal scholars said, okay, Paul is a liar because there's nobody by this name in the Bible. And um, there, it's not possible because there's nobody historically, there's no evidence anywhere in Greek um, literature, text, archaeology, name this name. And his name is Eros Man. So if you can just imagine, we're going to call him Sexy Man. And so eros, you know, is obviously where we get that word erotic, and then man, so he's the, the sexy man. Well, if, you know, people are usually in many ways defined by their um, character or their background. You know, you get a nickname growing up. And, um, you know, we think about Barnabas, and Barnabas is technically a nickname. Uh, Barnabas' real name is, in Acts chapter 4, is Joseph, uh, Joseph of Cyprus. And he's cousins to John Mark. But we don't know him by that name. We know him because he's the son of encouragement. Or we know James is the son of thunder. 
Well, this guy is going by, well, we'll just say he's going by his nickname, whatever you want to say. But he's got this, this, this name, and all of a sudden, here he is. So here is a guy who's sort of a business guy, a treasurer. He's taking care of the public works. And what's really fascinating is in archaeology, they're digging in the 40s and 50s, and they find this about eight-foot um, marble stone in Corinth. And it's got these brass letters um, cast in it and says, here, by Erasmus, this road is built in Corinth with his money, the city treasure. And so what they said Paul was a liar, now there's this archaeological proof. It sort of blows it away. It's the only time it's found anywhere in Greek history um, that this guy is this name. And so what we want to do is there's, there's a transformation that takes place in the Corinth church. That's pretty amazing as you look at the church start in first I mean in Acts chapter 18, and then by the time you see first and second Corinthians finish up, and Titus finally writes back and says, Hey Paul, Corinth is okay. Um, the church has come a long way over those six, seven years of trying to get healthy. And Angie's gonna explain one of the little areas in chapter eleven. Um, that is, I think, really reflects the heart of the church of Corinth and their love and their compassion for people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, Angie, tag your it. Okay, so as Jeff described, um, Corinth sat at the base of a very tall mountain. And at the top of this mountain, was a temple to Aphrodite. So Aphrodite was one of the main goddesses that was worshiped in Corinth, um, along with Apollo, which was um, one of the first temples that was actually built in Corinth. But for the temple worship, there were a thousand prostitutes, as Jeff had mentioned, and these were both men and women, usually young boys and girls, um, that were employed by the temple and were pretty much slaves to the priests of Aphrodite. And it was such a long trek for the townspeople from Corinth to climb up this mountain to worship Aphrodite. So the prostitutes would actually come down the mountain every day and infiltrate the city um, so that they were available for the temple worship. One way well, the main way to recognize these prostitutes in the middle of a crowd was that they were all bald. They had shaved their hair, both the men and the women. So it would be easy to identify them. Well, as the church in Corinth began to grow, as they began to share Christ, as they began to love loud, as we've seen um, through the scriptures, as they gain in health, these temple prostitutes began to believe in Jesus and were brought into the church. Now at that time, the head covering or the hair for men was short in the style. So it did not take very long for men's hair to grow back. And then they looked like normal citizens in Corinth. But for women, the hairstyles were long hair, um, usually curled, put up on top of their head, just many different hairstyles and ways to wear their hair. So it took a long time for the girl's hair to grow out where they looked normal in society. So the girls would sometimes wear a covering over their head so that no one could see that they had a shaved head, which was just an indication of the life that they had just come out of. But even with a head covering, not many women wore the head covering in Corinth, so it was still sort of indicative of their previous life. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is actually talking to the women to say, you need to love your neighbor in this situation. If you don't all want to shave your heads and identify with them, then let's all cover our heads so that we can identify with them and help these girls grow. So. Um, the women began to cover their hair because um, they had the long hair in anticipation to wait for these um, girls for their hair to come, come in and they wouldn't be um, seen or labeled as a previous um, temple worker. 
So as these um, temple workers were coming to Christ, the priests were not just going to release them and say, oh, sure, you have a new life, you know, just go. Because they brought in a lot of money for the temple of Aphrodite. So there had to be someone who had the esteem and the means to rescue these temple workers from that um, life of slavery. And so many scholars believe that that may have been Erastus or Erasmus who had that, the name and the means to rescue them and redeem them from that former way of life and where they could worship Christ in the church and be a believer and live that life. So we see how the church and even Erasmus started reaching out into that community and loving loud. And as we have served in Nepal and in India and now in Greece, that is one of the ways that um, we talk to the church about how to love loud. Um, because you, the, God's heart, of course, is to love, he loves all people and it is his desire that none should perish. And it should be our heart that we love all people. But that love that we have inside has to work its way out so that that love can be seen. Um, so we have this phrase that we just say, love loud. Loud enough to where the community can see your love and the people can see your love and how much you love them. So in our trainings, we talk about who God has placed around them to love. Who is it that God has placed around you? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your workmates. And how can you love them? We talk about what to say in the way of what has Christ done for you, just simple, you know, just in a few sentences, how to say that, how to share the gospel in a very simple way, um, and then how to start discipling people. And so that is our trainings um, with the churches while we're overseas, and even here in the States, teaching that same thing here, because this is also a mission field. Um, so in one of our trainings in Athens, um, I was training some of the Arabic women um, who were already believers. And so one of the husbands who was providing the food for our lunch during the training was in the back, you know, and he was listening in on the training and stuff. And so after one of the days, he actually went out after the training and shared with these two women, these two other Arabic uh, Muslim women out on the street. And so he invited them to the training the next day. And so they came, but they also brought three other women with them. So there were five new Muslim women sitting in the training um, the next day. And so the Arabic believers really just moved in around them and were sharing with them actually what we had trained them to do. They were doing it, they were sharing, um, just wanting to learn more about those women. And so two of the women actually did um, end up believing in Jesus. And then those two new believers continued to minister to the families and continued to share with the families of the other three women who um, had not yet believed. Even after the training was finished, the Arabic women had like a weekly Bible study um, that they would get together and do. And so these women actually started coming to that Bible study as well. So the Arabic women continue to minister to them. Um, so that was just that love in action that you saw um, ministering to these other three families through just providing some diapers, some formula, because there were some young, young kids involved, some clothing, food for the family, um, just trying to show them the love of Christ that matched what they were saying to them as well, as far as how Christ had changed them and given them a love um, for their people and a desire that no one should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Um, we, in sharing, um, it is somewhat dangerous in the camps that they have there because um, there are some remnants of like the Taliban or ISIS or some other um, groups like that. So you, um, when they share, they have to be very careful how they do it. You can't just go out with a bullhorn and um, share, but a lot of just one-on-one. -on -one. 
um, getting to know someone, sharing their testimony, sharing what God has done, loving loud in those communities. Um, we did have one lady who um, shared, was just overjoyed, just sharing with a lot of people. Well, she got thrown out of the camp um, because they don't want the word of God necessarily in there. She got thrown out of the camp. And so the believers just came around her, gave her a place to stay until she could find another place. But it is just exciting to see the book of Acts actually coming true in Athens or coming true in India. It has not stopped. God has not stopped. God is continuing to work um, in Athens through the refugees, just like we've seen him work in India and Nepal, and even here in the States, um, which has just been so encouraging and rewarding for us. Um, just, uh, I, want, I want you to just think about where can you be loving loud? Where can you be impacting the community? You know, the needs, when we think about suffering right now, one of the most difficult things for me as a leader in missions, I've been having to make decisions with, you know, missionaries and things like that because there's nowhere to retreat in the world right now. There is suffering and difficulty everywhere. And so what, what are you going to do in your neighborhood? What are you going to do in your community? What are you going to do in your sphere of influence? Because we have a responsibility to, to love loud, but also proclaim the gospel just as loud. And um, I was watching in India, and they're such an example to me. And um, I was watching, uh, I was actually in India on March 20, I don't know, it was the 20th. They just all of a sudden, boom, said they're going to close down. And I had to make a split decision Okay, I'm either going to spend five months in India without my wife, or I'm going to come home and see my wife. So I, I came home, and we couldn't be in Greece, so we, we, I came home, and I just started watching the feed on um, these guys sharing how they were rushing in in the middle of the pandemic. And it reminded me of the Antonian Plague in 166, 167 in Rome. There was this incredible plague, and with this plague, there were people dying all over Rome. And the Christians literally ran to Rome with the gospel and they began to love and meet, meet needs and take care of people. And there was a, a writer who wrote as he was leaving Rome, he said, you know, these Christians think they're immortal. They think they're, they're, they're crazy. And here they are running in and they are meeting leads and they're loving loud. And Rome went from 6% Christian to about 60 plus percent Christian in that season in the midst of suffering and difficulty. And sometimes in the midst of the difficulty is when God is moving the most. And so these brothers in India uh, began rushing out to feed people because literally there's no stopgap in a place like India. When a day laborer loses his job, there's no opportunity. So one, one network has fed about 100,000 people in the last, say, six weeks. What's crazy, though, is about 37,000 people have professed Jesus. There's about 31, 3,200 baptisms. It's a little bit of lag time between sharing the gospel, getting to baptism, and then discipling. But uh, about 27, 28 churches planted. Just, just in the last, we just, we've never seen anything like this before in India been working there 21 years and God's moving at an unprecedented way. But I want to just share one little story. There was one particular tribe that's an unengaged, unreached people group, just like we were talking about on that video. And this guy was a persecutor. He was a priest. And he was persecuting the Christians. And in the midst of this, the Christians began to feed him and they began to meet the needs. And as he's these needs are being met. He's going, why are you doing this? I'm the, I'm the guy who was the persecutor. I'm the guy that was giving you the trouble. And in the end, this man repented and believed in the name of Jesus. And he began to be, learn how to share his story, learn how to share Jesus' story. He learned how to be discipled. It was about as far as our team got with him in India. And then the opportunity for him to go back to his home village came. Now we're talking about walking. We're not talking about like he just hopped in his car. He doesn't have a car. He's walking to his village, hundreds and hundreds of miles away in 110, 115 degree heat because he wants his family to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he walks and as he goes, he proclaims the gospel on the way and he gets to his family and five, six family members now have come to Christ 
And then he calls up and he said, we want to meet needs here in our community and we want to love loud. And it's just amazing, and I can just multiply that story over and over again. A guy in Venezuela who's a refugee in Ecuador hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, gets trained how to share his story, Jesus' story, because somebody's feeding and meeting a need, and he's like, i got to go back home, and he walks home to Venezuela. And as he goes, he proclaims the gospel on the way, and he's now back in Venezuela, led his family to Christ, because the power of the gospel transforms lives. The other thing I want to share about Erasmus is he not only loves loud and he's meeting physical needs and meeting financial needs like helping Paul go to Spain or maybe possibly help ransom these ladies. Um, He also in Acts chapter 19 um, verses 19 through 22, um, he is on mission with Paul. And so he is going on mission to Ephesus. And then he's also up in Miletus in the Macedonia area. Um, he's Macedonia, not Miletus, right? That was, Miletus was Corinth, sorry. And so he's up there on mission in Macedonia with Timothy, proclaiming the gospel. So here's, because I want you to get the picture. This is not, this is not some, the only thing special about him is that he knows Jesus. And he's taken what he's got and he's loving loud, he's meeting needs, and he's involved with the mission of God locally, and he's involved in the mission of God, you know, in North Carolina and to the ends of the earth. And here he is going out doing this, and this is just what a normal Christian does. And so I want to just share about a, a man that's just, I've come to love and become a great friend of mine. His name is Danny. But Danny was known as O'Day when he lived in Iraq. And in Iraq, his father was a general in the Iraqi army, during the first Gulf War. And, but he was known as a really good guy. And so they put him, the US military, put him in charge of some certain things related to infrastructure. And um, he got put on a hit list by the Iranians and um, the Iranians killed him. And so then they were gonna go after O'Day. And they, we're talking about a Muslim killing a Muslim, by the way, here. So it's Shiite versus Sunni. And so he has to leave. And so he flees for his life as a young man, goes to Turkey. He's into drugs and alcohol and partying in Turkey, and he has a dream. And I'll get it right this time. I said that in the dream, he saw a big white man. That's not what I meant by that. In the dream, I said last service, I said he saw a big white man. In the dream, he saw a man who glowed as with this big white beard, long hair, and just a white glow about him who said, I am the truth. You need to pursue me, and you need to follow this way. And, but he doesn't, that's all he sees in the dream, but he has this dream over and over and over again. So he gets on the internet and he starts searching dreams and he finds out that many, many Muslims around the world are having dreams about Jesus. As he's doing that, he gets on Facebook and a Christian in America starts sharing the gospel with him and discipling him through Facebook and O'Day comes to Christ. He becomes Daniel and then he's proclaiming the gospel in Turkey. And you may remember when the persecution happened and the pastor from up there in North Carolina, here in North Carolina, ended up in prison. Uh, Danny went to prison at the same time during that time, had his jaw broken, his teeth knocked out. And then he got out and he escaped to an island in Greece called Lesbos. And in Lesbos, they handed him a ticket. In 48 hours, he could be in Germany, have a stipend, have money, have freedom. And he said, no, I am staying right here to proclaim the gospel to the Arab people, the Arab speaking people that are coming to Greece. This is the mission field. This is where I am called. And so he was out sharing the gospel, pretty well untrained. He ran into some of our friends out sharing the gospel. And it's like, oh, this is my tribe. And they recognized one another. And we've been working with uh, Danny ever since. And I just love this brother's heart for the gospel. And so Danny was sharing with, uh, it's pretty crazy when you're seeing former terrorists come to Christ who start multiplying disciples in the name of Jesus after they repent and believe in Jesus. So he's sharing the gospel with a guy named Shar, and Shar has physical needs related to his family. They're loving loud, we're buying some formula, helping with things um, with their family. Shar, a former PPK, PKK guy, repents and believes in the name of Jesus. His life is radically changed, and for the next two years, he's being discipled there in Athens. And he's learning how to multiply and share his story and Jesus' story and make disciples. He's beginning to help lead the local church. He and Danny then meet a man named Asim. Asim was a boxer 
and uh, like would be like a Golden Gloves type boxer, but he was also sort of one of the, the bad guys with the Shiite army and got hit with a U.S. bomb and had his leg messed up, arm messed up, but through some loving loud, meeting some needs, and he hears the gospel, um, he repents and believes, and then Shar and Danny begin to train and equip them. And then these two brothers, uh, one, one's one year old in the faith, the other's two years old in the faith, they said, we wanna go plant churches among Arabs. And so they moved to Hanover Journey, Germany, and there they are now planting a church among Arab speakers, Kurdish speakers in particular, and then the other brother Angie was sharing about, his name is Jabbar. He's the sweetest man you'd ever meet, just a big servant's heart. And so Jabbar also repented and believed. And then he shared, starts sharing the gospel in Mosul via uh, the web, do, do it through the internet. And five of his friends and family come to Christ. A guy named Muhammad who got blown up in a truck bomb. He repents and believes. And then Jabbar, um, who we watched just lead people Arab after Arab to Christ, um, he says, man, I want to go plant churches. And he moves to Stuttgart. And so these a year old believer going out say, I'm going to go to Stuttgart. I'm going to make sure the Arabs hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're watching God move across Europe. And you're seeing these churches in Europe fill up with all the, usually what we consider the bad news on the, when we're watching the news. And, but men and women from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, are repenting and believing in Jesus Christ and filling up the churches and multiplying churches across Europe. It's unprecedented. And now watching Kurdish people who are in London going back to Kurdistan to share the gospel, watching Iranians share the gospel back into Iran via different solutions on the internet and things like this. God is moving. So just like Erasmus went and got on mission, these are just normal people, you know, as a normal, they're former terrorists who repented and believed and radically changed and now pursuing the kingdom of God and trying to get to no place left that everybody gets to hear the gospel. But what, you know, what are we going to do right here? What are we going to do in Salisbury? What are we going to do here in North Carolina? Because we have this, there's this pandemic going on and we're seeing the, the sort of just everything that's going on in our cities. And, and there's only one solution. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's going to take some love and loud. And it's going to take some hard work and getting dirty. But it's the power of the gospel that transforms a guy who might want to, to kill somebody a few years ago. Who's now radically transformed and wants to take the gospel somewhere else. Only the gospel can do that. There's nothing else with the power to have that kind of transformation. So I want to just dare you as we look at these guys and girls, is what will you do? How will you love loud in your community? How will you share your story and Jesus' story in this community? How will you be on mission for God? Not only all the way across the ends of the earth, but listen, the nations are here. The nations, the opportunity is here right now. And we need to share the gospel and make disciples right here. If each of us would just... One person, just go out and love loud this year, share the gospel with them, begin to make a disciple. Just each of us, one, would just do one this year. Each one reach one, right? And so I want to just sort of wrap it up in the sense of um, what about America? You know, um, man, God's, I really believe God's going to move in this time. I, I think we're getting ready to see one of the biggest harvests we're already seeing one of the most incredible harvests overseas, I think, in history. In the midst of all kind of turmoil and trouble. But remember, the book of Acts, sit down and read it in one sitting one time. And look how much of it is pushed by persecution and suffering. And suffering is, there's something, it's a, it's a marinade for the soul. Where suffering, if we don't have a theology of suffering, and we think we're, this, is, this is all I'm going to do and I'm, I'm not going to suffer. We're, we're going to suffer. And now it's globally. But as we suffer, and suffering just it helps us identify with Christ. Paul said, as I suffer, I identify with Christ. And I identify with Christ's sufferings. And it's one of the greatest identities we have in Christ. Because in the midst of suffering, there's only one place I can go. It's to Him. And it's to my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And, and there's this crazy thing in Ephesians that says, as the suffering increases, it actually increases my ability to minister. You know, if you've been sick, or you've had cancer, or you've lost a loved one, well, all of a sudden you have the ability to meet, to meet the needs and minister to somebody that maybe I can't minister to. And God uses those difficulties and sufferings to increase our ability to love loud and meet needs. Now, I don't necessarily like that particular theology and doctrine, but it is clearly in Scripture that this is, until we're glorified, until we're there in His presence, this is part of where we're at. But what an opportunity. So one of our young ladies who served in India when she was getting ready to go to India, um, her, her dad literally was like, why are you doing this to me? Why? He's not a Christian. Why are you doing this to me? Why would you do this? Why would you take money from the church and go over to some foreign country and do this? And he was really angry with her and just, just really far from God. And well, she had to come home because of the pandemic, sort of ran out of the visa time. And so she called up her family and said, hey, would you study the Bible with me? And they began studying the Bible together on Zoom. Um, I'm so tired of Zoom, but uh, Zoom's been a great ministry opportunity in the last uh, three or four months that's been incredible. But they began studying the Bible, and her dad joined the Bible study. And for five, six weeks, he participated studying a thing we call the Seven Stories of Hope. And he's learning more about Jesus, and his life's being transformed through the power of the Word of God, because the Word of God will not return void until it accomplishes its purpose. And so this dad was transformed. And a couple weeks ago, um, got to see a picture of his daughter and son-in-law baptizing him down in a lake in Texas. Now we're talking about, if, if there was a red light, a hard stop, you know, and you're supposed to stop, this was a hard stop when it came to the gospel. But look what happened right there. Another friend of mine down in Florida, um, we work with a thing called I Am Second, and he's in Florida and he's reached out to his high school buddies and he's, he's been trying to share the gospel with them for years. We well, calls up in the middle of the pandemic, probably about six weeks ago to three high school buddies said, Hey guys, would you study the Bible with me via zoom? And they said, yeah, all three have repented and believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another friend of mine in LA, he got on Instagram. I don't even know what the heck that is, but he gets on Instagram and he shoots out a message through his Instagram followers and says, does anybody want to study the Bible? And four people who are far from God wrote back and said, we would like to study the Bible with you. One of them was a famous sportscaster in LA and said, yes, I want to study the Bible. I want to understand about God. And so in LA, we went from zero groups I am second groups to 162 I am second groups in LA. And we're just seeing God move in an unprecedented way. It doesn't make sense when we see the pandemic, we see the suffering, we see the turmoil, we see the unrest, um, but God is at work. And the question is, what are we gonna do about it? What, what will we look like uh, rushing in to this? Are we hoping to get back to this normal? I'm not so sure there'll ever be a normal again after this. But one thing I hope is my heart is transformed with more passion and more desire, uh, not only for the gospel, but to see people discipled and see lives transformed. And so I just want to ask you, what are you going to do here as a church? Are you going to how are you going to respond as the Corinth church responded? And, um, you know, I, I shared... Um, 1986, Ron Barbagli at Charlotte Transit System shared the gospel with me. I'm 54 years old. Um, I, I worked in a business for 16, 17 years. Then I've been overseas and been all over the, you know, all over the globe. And only one person in my lifetime has shared the gospel with me from their mouth to my ear. And that was Ron Barbagli. Listen, I, I only got one chance do you know how many people out here in this community have never had somebody, maybe they heard it on the radio, maybe they saw it on the TV, but they've never had anybody look at them with compassion and love and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to them right here in this county, right here in your workplace. And there's many of them who will never darken the door of a church, but they would sit down maybe right now if somebody would pray for them and somebody would care for them and somebody would just sit down and have a conversation about how God transformed their life. 
We live in one of the greatest opportunities for the gospel of Jesus Christ right now, I believe, in my heart of hearts. And so my question is, what are you going to do about it? Because I got one shot, and thankfully, you know, I, I, my life's been transformed and changed. But if there was no Ron Bag Bar Barbagli, who was crazy enough to share the gospel with me, I don't know where I'd be. I'd be a mess, I know that. So I just want to challenge you. Man, love loud in this community. Be involved in mission in this community. And love and loud with the, your, your resources, your time. But don't shrink back from sharing the gospel. This is an opportunity to pray and care for people. Amen? Does anyone else want, <clears throat> want to say with this pastor this morning, thank you, God, for what you're doing? Thank you, God, that I had a chance to hear the gospel. Thank you that people around the world are hearing the gospel and responding. Uh, Lord, work in our lives uh, that we, too, might share with others your good news. Father, thank you for your word that has been planted in our lives today. Lord, may your word sprout, take root, and grow in our lives. And Lord, may it reproduce from our lives into the lives of others. Lord, as we have this time of invitation today, as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, help us to respond. Help us to believe. Help us to repent of sin. Help us to be obedient to your Holy Spirit as he works in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. For a world that is lost, a world that is dying, for the message of the cross, a world that changes daily, yet your truth remains the same. Here we are, Lord, send us, we will go in Jesus' name. there's some of you that would like the opportunity to keep in touch with the Sundells and where the Lord leads them and the ministries that they're involved in and, and to hear continuing stories about how God is working. Uh, Jeff, uh, share with our folks how they can connect with you all. Yeah, um, we got some of those cute little refrigerator cards um, in the back and then a little sign-up sheet where we send out a monthly newsletter 
Um, we actually I also have a thing. It's the number four fields.net is our website. So we actually put our newsletters there also. And um, I do a couple of, I do some podcasts um, where we give some updates of what God's doing. Um, so that's probably the three best ways. But, um, and then the other thing I was, we've heard you guys have been involved in missions and short term mission trips and medical missions. Um, E3 Partners, we, we do um, a lot of uh, medical missions, in particular like Greece and Frankfurt and Africa and Asia and South America. So uh, we're very involved in places like that. And then, um, of course, other places proclaiming the gospel and making disciples um, around the globe through short-term mission trips. So we'd love to invite you to be involved in that in any way we could. So, But thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Angie. Uh, Maybe one or two of you might remember early in my ministry with you, I, I shared a message called The Four Fields. Guess where I heard uh, first about the, the four fields and that concept. Uh, Jeff and Angie have been a great blessing uh, in my life and lives of many others that I know in the Charlotte area. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, they were able to come during this time. Uh, the Lord kind of, we get some detours in life, but I'm sure God has used this detour in many ways to bless you all as well as to use you to be a blessing to others. But you can get that information on your way out. Again, thank you for being here. Wade is going to come and uh, to share with us our, our offertory prayer and benediction all in one. We do remind you there are offering plates um, at the exits for your cheerful giving and we ask that you give generously. Please pray with me. Father God, we, we do know that you are here. We do know that you are still moving. You're moving in our hearts and our lives here in Salisbury, North Carolina and around the world. God, please help us to, to step up and do our part and bear our responsibility to do the same, that we need to be moving. We need to be serving right here. Serving by, by giving our time, our gifts, our spiritual gifts, our tithes, and Lord, we ask you to bless these tithes that we give today for the glory of your church. And as we leave and we go out today, help us to realize that we are indeed in the mission field. Every one of us. And help us to do our part and serve you and glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>